Welcome to Cargo Film Presents. I'm Dan. And I'm Dave. On Cargo Film Presents, we review and discuss documentary films. Today, we've got The Decline of Western Civilization to The Metal Years, which is the second in Penelope Shearer's legendary music documentary trilogy about music subcultures from the inside out. This movie is about groups, metal, guitars, girls. Ozzy Osbourne and Poison, the megastars and the rising stars of metal. While Decline 1 was about punk kids, Decline 2 surveys the glam metal scene in Los Angeles from August 87 to February 1988 that exploded around the Sunset Strip. In this film, built mostly around stylized interviews, she talks with those at the top and the bottom from big names like Aerosmith, Ozzy Osbourne, Kiss, uh, as well as bands on the verge to unknown strivers uh, about the headbanging lifestyle and their dreams of sex, drugs, and making it big in metal. So Dave, was hair metal the decline of Western civilization as we know it? No, no, in fact, it was the opposite. It's what uh, Alice Cooper said in the film, right? He said that heavy metal music saved rock and roll in the 80s. You don't agree? Come on. Anyway, uh, I mean, did none of these people watch the film Spinal Tap? I bet you uh, Penelope Spears did because the, the film often feels like it's a, uh, it could be uh, extra footage in, in the Spinal Tap uh, Blu-ray. Um, I mean, even the way some of the concerts are shot and the interviews are, are set up. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, sometimes even, even if it isn't uh, trying to be. Um, so, uh, you know, there's definitely a wink wink to the spinal tap if all you if exhibit a would be uh paul stanley uh his uh, the, the uh of kiss and the way he's set up with in bed with three beautiful women in lingerie you know uh it's it's hilarious i, I like i suppose the most uh about this film is the way P uh, penelope spheres uh, becomes a character in her films uh, she's not seen but she's heard she's asking questions and plenty of, in, 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 you know, of interrupting of, of people. If she uh, is not getting the answer she wants, it feels like it's a, a free flowing process, you know, very organic. And uh, one, clear is, one thing is clear is that uh, she's got an agenda. She's gonna get her, her interview and get her answers. So uh, it almost feels like uh, she hasn't got that much time, you know, and, and these people uh, are, are uh, kind of in her way and she needs to get get stuff in a hurry. I don't know if that was a budget issue or, or what, but she's very much a person in control of uh, that process. And, and the nice thing is that the people that she's interviewing don't seem to resent her for it. They don't seem to, you know, mind her being uh, interrupting and, you know, asking follow-up questions abruptly. And, uh, you know, there's this sense of trust between her and her subjects. And you see that, I think, across all three of her decline films. Uh, you know, she's, uh, she's uh, kind of like one of the, one of the gang and, and she's treated as such. And I think that's one of her strengths as a, as a documentary uh, filmmaker across these three films. I would agree with that. I was um, thinking in, in one sense, you could compare her to like a Joan Didion of these music subcultures in the sense that she's got, you know, this insider access. She's got the yeah. trust of of, of the people in these worlds. She's obviously, you know, friends with some of them and yet she still maintains this critical distance from, from these scenes in a way, um, yep. you know, which allows her to, I think, look at them in both sometimes a tender way and sometimes a very <laughs> caustic, almost critical way. Uh, you know, so I think that is, yeah, kind of central to, to her documentary filmmaking. I guess there yeah. were uh, another thing that I wanted to point out about Decline is, is Spheres. You know, she, we have to say that she looks at a very particular slice of the metal scene. So this is, mm -hmm. you know, hair metal <laughs> at a very kind of, you know, pivotal time when you had all of these bands flocking to LA from all over the country to make it, you know, without kind of realizing that metal had sort of peaked, this kind of metal had peaked al already. You know, you had Guns N' Roses were like yep. massively successful and these older rockers that she interviews like Ozzy and Aerosmith, 
they're already sobering up and they, you know you can see them kind of looking at in ways to reinvent themselves out of this um you know kind of hair band glam glam metal stuff grunge is just around the corner in the early 90s so you know mm -hmm. metal is is really glam metal is running out of hairspray but yet you have all these <laughs> bands coming and so the film is like you know is is you get the sort of feeling of the the fumes of this subculture burning out this like last gasp of late reagan excess decadence full of kind of insufferable you know juvenile guys and they're bragging about drug use their sexual exploits and spheres you know she captures this um you know kind of expertly uh this this moment yeah. this kind of unpleasant vibe i'd say that <laughs> it's the scene you know at times yeah it's it's sort of funny and then it then it gets really sour <laughs> But what do they really want to be? I would say happy. I'm a happy camper. I don't work. I can't stand work. We don't work. This is, we play music. We are not role models for your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so you, would, uh, you would lump the, uh, the Aerosmiths and the Ozzy Osbournes as uh, the precursor to, to this scene uh, essentially, kind of separate, right? Just because they're the uh, the elder statesmen of 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 the group, not quite what she's uh, trying to uh, capture here. They, but she still presents them as as connected to to uh, to this to this uh, this whole this whole thing in LA. That's right. I mean, it seems like the, you know the, those guys, those elder statesmen, as you, as you call them, um, you know, are what these bands. Who, who all kind of flock out to LA, who they want to be, you know, who right. they're kind of modeling themselves on, except that right. model has now become kind of a, a parody almost by the, by the late eighties, um, you know, this. <laughs> yeah. And you see it in some of the performances, which, you know, I didn't particularly enjoy myself. I mean, they're almost laughable. I mean, I don't particularly like this genre of music, but you know, you see these, <laughs> these guys, just the, um, the exaggerated bravado of these live performances. The one band, uh, what which band was it? The guy Randy O. I'm trying to look at what the band was. Was it uh, Randy O? Was it because uh, you know there's one I remember from. I think the band was called London. London, there's London. Yeah, Randy O was the guy wearing the chaps. Right. Uh, you know, showing yeah, his. Yeah, I think that was. Was it the guy who who uh, you know? Because I was going to remark on a, on one song that was absolutely hilarious called uh, uh, "Russian Winter." <laughs> All right, and and I think she showed almost the entire song in this film just to to show uh, to display you know the the lack of of uh, musical chops a lot of these bands have you know and and this is a song called russian winter that's supposed to be some kind of uh statement on american russian uh geopolitics you know so yeah. um you know uh there was a there was a a lyric that uh, read hellbound hellbound beware of the russian winter in the usa so you know that's what you're dealing with here it's still not as bad as what i think is the worst lyric ever written which is john bon jovi's um, I wake up and I French kiss the morning from Bed of Roses. Definitely the worst lyric oh, in rock and roll. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Take a side <laughs> there. Um, uh, Ozzy Osbourne is is as as you mentioned, he's he's great uh, in this. He shows some of that exposed early charisma that made him a, a TV star later on, and and also probably the most hilarious edit in this film is is Ozzy right talking about the effects of taken too much too many drugs as a young uh, rock star and at the same time he's making breakfast and they cut to him pouring orange juice into a glass and he can't keep a steady hand enough to to pour it properly so the orange juice is falling all up all on the table <laughs> <laughs> and you know this i noticed is a second time that spheres uses interviewing um one of her subjects while they're making breakfast uh, she used it in, in Decline uh, 1 uh, as well. So there's a pro tip for all you wannabe filmmakers out there. If you want to interview your, your musicians, uh, catch them making breakfast. Uh, there uh, They become instantly more relatable. <laughs> Rock and roll. Why do they do it? I'm in it for the money. <laughs> no, no, a headbanger is someone that drives by in that car and goes, Melody! How do they 
I just hope that nobody ate that breakfast that Ozzy made because it looked, <laughs> it looked like it could kill well, someone. Who knows? I mean, it looked like he knew what he was doing, but who the heck knows? <laughs> I, I read that that scene was staged, the orange juice. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, and, okay. And That's unfortunate. Yeah, I know. I was a little disappointed with that. And yeah. it's, not, it's not Ozzy's kitchen either. Ah, uh, I see. So, well, you mean when you mean the setting isn't Ozzy's kitchen? Correct. Yeah, or or not just or not just that edit? You mean? Okay. Oh yeah, the whole yeah the whole setting that wasn't Ozzy All Osbourne's right. real. Well, he was clearly movie. making breakfast. Though. He was he was making breakfast. All right. I'm sure that's how he makes breakfast. <laughs> right. Right. That part right. is probably accurate. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting, you know that that uh, you talk about the setting. Apparently, what I had read is that she had the uh, all the uh, musicians pick their setting uh, mm -hmm. of where they want to be interviewed. I guess uh, that's her way of making people feel, you know, comfortable. Uh, and hence that's why uh, Paul Stanley of Kiss, you know, decides to be interviewed, you know, in, in bed with three women in lingerie. And, and Gene Simmons, I believe is at a lingerie shop with women, half naked women walking around shopping. That's where he chose to be uh, interviewed. So yeah, another sign of uh, 80s, uh, sensibility there uh, front and center. And there's also a particular kind of genius to doing that, I think, it was Spears. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, how intentional that was, but, you know, by, by allowing, you know, these musicians to choose where and how they would like to be interviewed, you know, they are creating a kind of fantasy, a sort of performance that, you know, she's able to she's able to undermine by, you know, the questions that she's asking and the right. juxtaposition of those interviews, you know, the way she mm -hmm. puts them together. <laughs> you start to think like, oh man, like these guys are just, uh, just really insufferable and, and, you know, total narcissistic maniacs. <laughs> and yeah. they, you know, they're building this whole performance, this whole fantasy, and she's able to reveal, you know, truths about, um, you know, you know, she's not observing this scene really as a kind of fly on the wall, but she is able to reveal truths more about their attitudes, their Correct. psychologies, their insecurities. Yep. Um, and this is funny and it's sad. And mostly I found it kind of ugly. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think it's, you're right. Those, this, those choices they made are, are, are revealing. Um, you know, I'd say, I'd say half of them were probably pretty funny and, and the other half, the half were pretty sad. I mean, clearly we have to talk about the saddest part sequence in the whole film and that's Chris Holmes, right? I think it's, he's the Wasp guitarist. Yeah. Guitarist yeah. of Wasp. Yeah. I mean, that scene is definitely one of the most unsettling I've ever seen. The poor guy's laying on his swimming pool, uh, swimming pool float, uh, and, and essentially drinking himself blind, uh, you know, talking about how much fun his life is, you know, for the first part of that, he had his mom right sitting uh, poolside yeah. uh, next to him, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, but it does turn very sad because you know he, he starts talking about it, what a terrible person he is, and uh, this is a spoiler alert. So if anybody wants to watch this film and doesn't want to know, you know what what happens here, you should you should stop uh, viewing this now. But I have read that uh, apparently in that first half of that interview with Chris Holmes he had a bottle full of vodka but then in the substance subsequent uh uh you know uh, pieces of footage that you see him with another full bottle of vodka it's it's pool water that he's drinking um and so that that made me feel instantly better that that he was <laughs> not just drinking bottle after bottle filled uh with with vodka right so it was yeah and this is I think the kind of the the brilliance of this of this film, you know, even though it's a really uh, hard and painful scene to watch, is that's where it just all of the all of the flashiness, all of the image, you know, the debauchery, the excess of this of this scene, and you know, these musicians all bragging and 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 yeah. building it up, it just all crumbles and falls apart in that right. pool with the vodka bottles. And you're just like, wow, this film is not really a celebration of, you know, metal or, you know, glam rock culture. It's really a cautionary tale about, you know, pursuing, uh, you know, a rock and roll lifestyle. 
And I did, the guy, Chris Holmes, he disputes it though. He says it was vodka. He says, he said, you know, my oh. eyes were burning, you know, my eyes were burning. I wouldn't, you know, be poor. My eyes wouldn't be burning if I was pouring, pouring pool water on them. But I guess they would be as well. They would, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if, the, if the water is chlorine. Listen, the guy was was blind drunk. They, do we really need to? Will rely on his recollection of the incident or or Penelope Spears? I don't know. That's an easy call. That is an easy call. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, he reenacted it this scene. Uh, That's right. Well, yeah. you know, because the first thing I did after I saw that sequence, like, is this guy still alive? Because yes, of course, right. And and in fact, you see, yes, and there was also a documentary made about him as of. 2021 did you come across that called uh, mean man the story of chris holmes it's on, it's on amazon prime for anybody who wants to see it i did not check it out and then they also with his current wife they recreate the whole sequence of him in the pool with the, his wife asking him the same questions you can find that on online too anyway the, we won't be reviewing that one but you can no <laughs> <laughs> no 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 no, but but you're right. Uh, clearly, he is presented as one of the casualties of yeah. of the scene, and uh, that, that's certainly an extreme example of um, of the the subjects uh, that are are uh, you know presented here. Uh, anything else catch your eye here in the in the film? Yeah, I think we may have touched on it a little bit, but just you know, I thought it was also very clever how the you know the film is structured with these interviews and. Yeah. Um, you know, so you do get uh, to hear from people from the top, the elder statesmen, so to speak, you know, these bands who are maybe on the bubble of, you know, becoming the next big thing. And then these total unknowns and, and Sphere spends time with all of them. And these interviews are, um, you know, structured in such a way that, again, the questions sort of begin in a benign and fun way, like what is metal and, you know, these kinds of things. And, you know, we qu quickly start to get to what happens if you don't make it and right. you know like the um chris holmes one other i think it may be this guy randy oh again who says you know he he will kill himself he's in a hot tub right so that's right. half naked women and he's yep. like I'll kill myself if i don't make it and you know yeah you just just the kind of real emptiness of this of this scene starts to emerge i think you know because of the way in which he has arranged um these interviews. To be a rock and roll star is the greatest thing in the world. Then you've got to think of divorces, management ripoffs, fatigue, drugs. Another thing I thought was of note was, you know, why this film became a kind of cult classic. You know, you can say the film itself, but then also the way, it, you know, it, it was released. I think it was in, in cinemas maybe in the late 80s and then mm -hmm. sort of disappeared. Spheres mm -hmm. had the rights to the the DVD rights, but she didn't kind of do anything with them. So the film became, um, you know, bootlegged everywhere. And so it was mm. passed around in sort of circles. And I think even, you know, uh, maybe Dave Grohl talks about that, how, you know, musicians would watch it and it became a real underground, you know, sensation. And then recently, I guess, 2015, maybe it was fine. She and her daughter re remastered it. it was re oh, nice. In, in a box set in 2015 so i think now it's it's getting the kind of more mainstream cultural attention all three are now in the library of congress i believe um, is that right okay yeah um, yeah anyway they, but they are available that's great yeah 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 um so the, the yeah the, and uh, also it, it had these the film did have some weird segues into like the uh, the cat house which was like a heavy metal club <laughs> And that dude, yeah. uh, Bill Gazzari, that old dude, you know, who liked hanging out with uh, young women. That, that was a little sideways, I thought, but I suppose they wanted to change some of the textures of the just the interviews and uh, that uh, they were having uh, with subjects to go, uh, you know, uh, in, in different areas. But, but I thought that that stalled it a little bit. And then, and then how about the, the strange, um, weird segue into the kind of... Uh, the whole influence of the imagery of heavy metal music and, and the culture and how parents into the eighties were so concerned that their kids were turning into Satanists and that, uh, that you even had like, um, you know, people in charge of demetaling the youth, <laughs> which, you know, is, that doesn't really age, uh, so well, uh, you know, looking back on that, uh, now, and even the woman who's talking about demetaling doesn't even seem like she believes what the hell she's saying, you know, um, so that was that was a strange aside. That was. I wasn't really sure how 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 serious to take that. I mean, it did almost yeah. feel like it was 
kind of spoof like territory. Spoof, yeah, very, very yeah. close. Like, is this, this, is this for real? Come on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, but you know what? Shout out to Megadeth. I have never listened to their music, but those guys appear at the end and they easily sound, and they should be heard a little snippet of their music and easily sound as the most musical interesting of any of the music that they presented in this movie. Do you know these guys at all? I do. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, a little bit, you know, uh, again, not much of a fan of this style of music, right. but you know, from what I understand and people that I knew who were into metal and certainly Megadeth was a band you should take seriously. And I, as yeah. you say, you know, Spheres puts them at the end. Again, I think tipping her, her hand in a way of how she feels about maybe some of these other bands and, and how, you know, serious we should take them. I, you know, I think she does, she, she, she has a, a real affection and tenderness for the characters and for the people. But, the, you know, music wise, I think she just thinks this is like, you know, this is a bit of a joke. And if you are going to listen to metal or take metal seriously, then you should probably look at something like Megadeth and, and right. she does give them that opportunity at the end of the film to go like, oh, well, this is like real, you know, deeper, serious metal. Right. These are actual, you know, musicians Correct. trying to put out some some interesting uh, music and and they seemed also kind of, you know, first of all, they seem sober and, and, uh, you know, and, and smart and answered just a couple of questions. Like, I want to hear more from these guys, you know, but, but I guess then it would have um, been such a departure from the, uh, the rest of the film that she couldn't have uh, uh, spent too much time there, which, uh, which is unfortunate, but, but they were, uh, they were, they were, they sounded interesting. So, all right, well, there you have it. Where can we catch The Client of Western Civilization Part 2? I got it on Amazon, uh, but I know it's on Documentary Plus, right? It is. It's on. I saw it on right. Documentary Plus. So we should give a shout out to uh, the folks over there who we yeah. know. Um, yeah, you can check it on. Check it out on Documentary Plus for free. Is it free on Amazon as well? I guess it... Yeah, I believe it is. Um, well, if you're, if you're a Prime member. Prime member. Yeah. I think it's on maybe some other place as well. I want to say Criterion, but could be wrong there right. uh, and you can also obviously pick up the uh box set you know if you if you want to check out all three we focused on the second one the first right. one, third i guess you know we'll we'll decide if <laughs> right the, the third one is absolutely it's completely different you know it's hardly a music film but but uh, still still very interesting all, all three are interesting in their own way and, and should be should be watched well, there you have it. Check out all three. Uh, but if you want the the laughs and the the hairspray and the makeup, <laughs> go. and 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 decide for yourself whether this is uh, Spinal Tap Part Two or not. There you go. Yep. All right. So that's it. Okay. The Cloud of Western Civilization Two: The Metal Years. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you later.